So my task could be to visit with you about some of our research recommendations on, on soybean plant establishment. And so I have a series of questions I'll, I'll try to answer. I have them split by, by uh, subject matter uh, relating to planting decisions. And one of the things to be popular based on Hans's uh, presentation was planting data maturity groups. So I'm gonna show you a, a trial we conducted at the center this past season that is a bit, the results are a bit contrary compared to a long-term research with the uh, interaction of planting dates and maturity groups. And then I'd like to review with you our, our current guidelines on, on the interaction of plant populations and role spacings. And then there's a couple of subjects within plant nutrition that I'd like to uh, share some, some research information. That'll be a warm-up session for Dave France and will follow me. And then I do want to talk about cover crops. Um, there's a, a fair amount of interest in cover crops, especially preceding uh, soybean. And so I want to give you an update on some of the work we're doing at Carrington uh, relating to cover crops. So we'll get into uh, plant establishment. As with any crop, it's, it's critically important to have a good stand establishment. That makes our, our life as crop managers and farmers much easier throughout the season to to produce a profitable crop. So if you've heard me speak on soybean production in the past, you've probably um, seen me display this chart and I thought it'd be appropriate to do it again this morning uh, because it's a nice uh, way to kick off uh, plant establishment discussion. So in, in this table, I list nine factors relating to establishing soybeans. And there's um, two options, option A and option B we would like to suggest going with the option A because of the yield responses, the positive yield responses we've seen um, based on the, the trials that are listed on the, the right-hand uh, column. And so the, there are a number of these factors, five of them actually, that I have uh, listed as in a green color. That means that I will be taking a little bit of time during my discussion to uh, to give you an update within these. But to use this, uh, this uh, simple chart, for example, on tillage system, we found that on combination of many trials that NDSU conducted, actually 37, we saw a yield advantage of uh, averaging 4% with some type of reduced till system as compared to conventional till. So we can look through the other, other uh, factors and what the, the yield comparisons are with the, with the two options. But um, the main thing is that this is a, if you choose option A, this is a starting point. And then it's up to you to, to um, revise it and, and uh, make it uh, work from that on a person's farm or in particular on a specific field. So again, it's a starting point. It's up to you to, to uh, manipulate that to make it work uh, in your individual situation. All right. <clears throat> So this is um, the opener for discussion about a, a trial that we had this past season on um, planting dates as well as maturity groups of soybean. And so what we did is we had three maturity groups. There are 1.0, 0 0.7, and 0 0.3, and then four uh, planting dates ranging from May 6, which was all too early this past season. That, of course, was uh, we had a late start to the season. And then our last planting date was all the way up to June 6. According to North Dakota Ag Statistics, in the state, on June 6, we had only 40% of our soybean acres that were planted. But a week later, we uh, made some major, major um, progress, and we were up to 75% of the soybeans were planted. So the upper picture is a picture of the early planted block. We planted on May 6, and then within the block, we had the three maturity groups. Plus, there was a, a guard in each end. So right here, this would be the maturity group 1.0, 0 0.7, and this was 0 0.3. And by the way, the picture was taken on September 12th. And then in contrast, the lower picture shows the late planted block, where we planted on June 6th. Here's the 1.0 maturity group, 0 0.7, and the 0 0.3.
All right, so what do we find with this demonstration? Well, average across the maturity group, <clears throat> we found as, as which is um, um, expected, that we had our, our best yield when we planted early. Keep in mind, the first half of May was, was not uh, optimal conditions by any means for, for planting soybeans. But even then, we did see our highest seal obtained when we planted early as compared to uh, mid to late May and then into June. And then this little uh, chart shows the average across planting dates. And what's interesting is that the 0 0.3 maturity group did provide the highest um, average yield. And that's a bit of a surprise because, uh, because um, when planting early, we would expect that we would see higher yields with the longer maturing types, as, as Hans had alluded to earlier. But in this case, the, the season was a bit unique. We didn't have very good growing conditions until later in May. And 0 0.3 is very well adapted to the Carrington area. So that's uh, last year we saw uh, our best yields with a uh, highly adapted maturity group. So if that's the case, our 0 0.3 performed well. And how did it perform across planting dates? What's interesting is, yeah, in the earliest planting date, we had the highest yield. And actually, it was higher than the 0 0.7 and the 1.0 maturity groups, which again is a contrast and not what we had expected. On the other end of the scale in planting June 6, it's not a surprise that the 0 0.3 was less season to work with that it was a higher yielding compared to the longer maturing groups. So I thought it was interesting, something unique that uh, would be of interest to uh, you as an audience. Next is a compilation of the information on the interaction of planting rates and row spacings. So for those of you that have been planting and growing soybeans for a long time, note that uh, NDSU's long-term recommendation has been establishing a stand of 150,000 plants per acre across row spacings. NDSU has been doing a lot of work actually for the past 25 years on one or both of these factors. And we thought it's time to, to analyze the data and see if we can have more precision recommendations on establishing our, our soybean stands. And so we did that. And we were able to compile the data, analyze it and write it up. And so here's the publication where you can get the details of, of this work. If you don't wanna do a web search, simply, um, like in NDSU soybean rates and roll spacings, and you should readily find this publication. What did we find? Well, um, in the eastern part of the state, essentially from Carrington eastward to the valley, we found narrow rolls were, were better. In this case, it was 12 to 14 inches as compared to uh, wide rolls in particular. And we had planting rates where we optimized yield at 170,000 pure lye seeds per acre. In the West, narrow rows again was the winner. Um, in the research that we did basically from rugby and westward, uh, seven to 10 inch rows uh, performed better yield wise as compared to wide rows. And the optimum planting rate was 150,000 pure lye seeds per acre. Now again, this is optimum yields, but not economic yields. And that'll be your homework. You need to consider this information and then adjust based on um, seed prices in particular, as well as market prices. So how do we apply this? Well, in the East, <clears throat> with narrow rolls, we said 170,000 pure life seeds optimized yield potential with the database that we have. Um, we need to, this to relate to stands. And typically, even with the when we plant a pure life seed, we're gonna lose about, <clears throat> about 10% of our our uh, potential stands just because of things happen out there. And so if you use 10% as our field loss, it comes out to be 100, about 150,000 plants per acre. And what's interesting is that corresponds with our long-term uh, recommendation. In the West, it's the plant population would expect to be a little bit less, usually narrow rows, 150,000 pure life seeds per acre, and that 10% fuel loss, we're at about 135,000 as an early season stand that should optimize the yield. 
And so um, scrutinize this data and then use it as a starting point and then adjust as, as fitting on your farm or, or your field. But certainly we highly recommend to get out there once the stand is up, see what you have for a stand and consider that as you make plans for future years. Okay, let's next move into soybean fertility. And um, Dr. Franson led the, the charge to revise our soybean soil fertility guide. If you wanna look this up, if you don't have access to it or haven't looked at it, uh, the web search simply by typing in uh, NDSU soil fertility. A common question that, that we get is, uh, can we apply phosphorus ahead of the soybean crop? Say if we have corn ahead, can we apply phosphorus for the corn crop as well as applying extra for the following year's soybean crop? And our standard uh, recommendation or suggestion at least would be that no, since most of our North Dakota soils are low in phosphorus, uh, we feel it'd be better to make the phosphorus application for the corn crop, and then the next year make the application for the soybean crop. But we thought it'd be very important to explore this. And so with help from the Soybean Council, we've generated data at Carrington for two years so far in 21 and then this past season. And then also Minot has data from this past season. And so of course the trial requires two years. Our, our soil analysis at Carrington on, when conducting the trials um, purposely was low, anywhere from two to seven parts per million. And Minot was on the low end of the medium range where they had eight parts per million. So they applied the fertilizer using triple superphosphate uh, based on NDSU um, extension recommendations and of course on the soil analysis. And the potential benefits are that it'd be wonderful if we could apply the uh, phosphorus fertilizer for the corn as well as the soybean on the first year, the initial year, and that would avoid some fertilizer application and incorporation costs on the year of, of soybean. And maybe we'll, we'll discover that there's an opportunity to reduce fertilizer rates. We'll see about that. So this is a, a picture of the first year of the corn trial. And we simply have three treatments, entry to check, Treatment number two is where we apply the phosphorus for the corn only, and treatment three is where we apply the phosphorus the corn as well as the soybean, but do this on the first year. And then we plant on the second year the soybean on the, on the footprint of the, the corn trial. And for P application, uh, the only thing we needed to do the year of the soybean was apply the phosphorus for the soybean. And so here's what we found. Um, I'm only showing you the Carrington data because it was low P testing soils ranging from four to seven parts per million. And note that we did have a, a trend for increased yield where we applied the phosphorus with both the treatments. And um, this is still preliminary data, but this would indicate that maybe the strategy of applying phosphorus for both crops the first year during the corn year uh, might be viable. But stay tuned on this. Um, hopefully, in 2023, our data will be will allow us to have statistical difference amongst the treatments, and uh, then we'll have we can draw a conclusion um, on the data. Um, also, Hans had talked about some work with biological seed treatments, and uh, at Carrington this past year, we did do work with five really premier um, seed inoculants. Those are listed. A note that. In the trial area, we didn't have soybean as a prior crop, um, not immediately prior, but it was in the mix uh, during the past uh, three to four years. And so uh, these treatments, if you're interested, you'll have to go on the web and, and see what they're comprised of. But I will mention that a, a couple of these are, are bio um, products. Uh, as an example, Tag Team has a bacteria that may aid in, in uh, supplying some modest amounts of phosphorus. And this pro yield is a product that uh, the company states that it may be useful to provide some, um, some iron available in the soil if we are struggling with IDC. And they also claim that maybe there'll be some additional sulfur present. All of these are liquid products. And as you can see by now, when we looked at some of the factors stand and especially with yield, there is no difference amongst these. 
And this is pretty uh, consistent with uh, many of the trials that we've conducted at Carrington in the past, where if we use a viable, a good, solid product, we use it properly on the application to the seed, that we see a, a response. We see good yields resulting from that. But we also see that there's um, no difference in the various inoculants, either when we compare various trade names and even in different formulations. We have a good product, we use it properly and in inoculating seed, we will get good results regardless of the trade name or formulation that's used. All right, my last subject is, is uh, use of cover crops. Uh, certainly with cover crops preceding soybean, and, and after, we want to avoid situations like this, soil erosion. Uh, cover crops can also help us with weed suppression and over the long term, uh, help to maintain or increase soil productivity for us. And so we're, we're excited about the prospects of, of rye. We've used rye uh, preceding soybean for quite a number of years, and there's more and more adaptation of this cover crop uh, by farmers. Uh, if you want details about using rye as a cover crop with any crop, um, we do have a nice publication recently put together and you can search the web by using NDSU rye cover crop. But specifically for soybean, um, we get questions each, each fall before the year before soybean are grown asking what is the best plant density based on my goals so in other words, when should I plant rye in the fall preceding soybean? What's the best planting rate? And we'll, we'll follow up and, sit and ask a question, well, what are your goals? And likely the goals are what I just talked about in the, in the previous slide. But some things we measured in the study that's supported by the North, North Dakota Soybean Council, we've generated four years of data so far and we're, we're set up to generate a fifth year of data. We're looking at ground cover, weed suppression, and then of course, soybean performance. And so this is a four-year average from our work at Carrington, uh, where we, I'm showing the specific dates where we planted um, the first time in the fall, and then the second planting dates, and then the planting rates of 25.50 and 75 pounds per acre. And so you can see the resulting average stand um, with the, the combination of dates and, and rates. And note that when we first started the trial, the first couple of years, we purposely went late with our first planting date, and of course, very late with the second one, just to try to answer if people are, are asking, well, how late can I go to um, generate some data to, to answer that question? We can go late, but as an example, look at the, the first planting date and the high rate, and compare that to the, the late planting date and uh, the high rate. Notice the the plant densities are this are very similar, but we have less ground cover when we delayed the planting until late into the fall. And that's because we can get a stand, but in the spring, the, the plants just are less vigorous and um, don't perform as well as when we plant earlier in the in the in the, the fall. Our general recommendation on on planting dates awry in the fall is from late late August through early October. And our, our range can be anywhere from 20 to 90 pounds of, of rye seed. So that's why we're doing this work, just to try to be a little more specific when people ask the best planting dates based on their goals. And of course, we measured a weed suppression. In this case, we had foxtail um, for three of the four years. So we made the, the measurements and note that, yes, we needed to plant um, early in the fall and have a, a stand of greater than a half million plants per acre in order to have even satisfactory suppression of the foxtail. So very simply, I uh, am showing the preliminary results after the four years and what we found with ground cover. Yeah, plant earlier in the fall with the highest rate, that'll give us the best chance of have adequate ground cover for, for the, the following spring to, to protect your soils from erosion until the soybean um, cover is sufficient. On weed suppression, here's the range that we've seen on average. And um, we're able to look at the fox hill as I showed you, but also kosha. And in general, the first or earlier fall planting date is best and the mid to high rate would be um, appropriate. 
and then I have the corresponding plants per acre or plants per square foot. I haven't mentioned the impact on soybean, but essentially when we manage the rye properly, we, we uh, terminated the rye. Uh, typically at the time we planted soybean and we saw no impact on the soybean plant development amongst the treatments. And the same is true on seed, wheel, seed yield. We had very good seed yield averaging in the low 50s amongst the treatments. Okay, and then to conclude, um, remember if you're using cover crops following soybean, either grasses or, um, or broad leaves, be aware of, of herbicide carryover. Uh, before I go there, I just want to mention that we do have a larger database of weed suppression and essentially use uh, cover crops such as rye. In this case, it's all rye with soybean and pinto bean. And uh, notice kind of suppression, but not complete control. It's a nice, uh, rye cover crop is a nice supplement to other uh, cultural methods as well as herbicides. Okay, so here's the table where we've generated data looking at the tolerance of cover crops following soybeans, where in the soybean crop, we used herbicides that have soil residual. And so we, we selected commonly used herbicides and note that radish, turnip, and canola were quite susceptible to many of these herbicides. On the opposite end of the scale, barley, winter rye, field pea, and in most cases, flax were quite tolerant uh, to these herbicides when they were planted um, late in the soybean season or right after the soybeans were harvested. You can find this information in the Wheat Control Guide. We also have a chart with wheat herbicides and their impact on uh, many of these same cover crops. And we're also working on uh, a corn chart with the, the similar information. Thank you.